So if characters are encountering her, they're already chilled to the bone and exhausted from travel and have, through whatever means, have found their way to the ocean floor. It's deep and dark and monochrome because light can't penetrate all the way down there. And inside this fortress are columns of glowing crystals and gems. And the first glimpse you catch of Melusine herself is just this bioluminescent light moving among them. She tends to this undersea garden with centuries of precision. She is a long serpentine glow, not even glow, just like a flash and a hint here and there, moving between corals and columns and forms, flashing in these mesmerizing patterns. And then when she finally does choose to reveal herself, she's lithe and tall with long black spines growing from her shoulders and her arms and down her back. She has hair like coiled serpents clinging tightly to her head and eyes that glow with that same bioluminescent above her angular cheekbones. She's just beautiful and deadly. Hello and welcome to Making a Monster Season 2, where game designers once again show you their favorite monster, and we discover how it works, why it works, and what it means. I'm Lucas Zellers. This season will bring you more of the best monsters tabletop gaming has to offer, along with deep dives in the new bonus episode format. More on that at the end of the show. For now, let me introduce you to this week's monster. Almost every tabletop role-playing game has three elements. A chance operator, like a 20-sided die, mechanics to influence those random results, and at least one setting that defines the genre and storytelling expectations of the game we're about to play. Dungeons & Dragons has had around two dozen official settings over its 47-year history. From the epic fantasy of Forgotten Realms to the quirky spacefaring adventures of Spelljammer, but the possibilities are still far from exhausted. Community creators are adding new settings on top of D&D's mechanics all the time. The subaquatic monster in today's episode comes from a setting based on the myths of King Arthur, and if you listen carefully, you might find you've seen it before on your morning cup of coffee. My name is Chris Hopper. I am a contributing writer for Realm Warp Media, which creates Cities of Myth, a several-part Kickstarter series exploring different famous cities in our shared mythological backgrounds. His first chapter is Fallen Camelot. Arthur Pendragon ruled Camelot and fought with various factions all across Albion, which is the modern-day island of Britain. I am taking what I would call a pseudo-historical bent. So our setting has a year. Modern day is 601 CE in the setting. Our Arthur is very much the post-Roman Arthur. He's this Celt that rose out of the chaos and turmoil that happened when Rome packed up and left after getting their butts handed to them by the Picts for 100 years. Arthur is this warlord who people loved, but who they also really feared because he, like his father Uther, is mainly very good at starting fights. And so (laughs) in Fallen Camelot, Arthur's dead. He's gone. Morgana set him up to fail in the big fight with Mordred, and they wipe out each other. Morgana assumes the throne, and she's ruling and making everything peaceful. And so that's the background. Morgana Le Fay, this powerful sorceress is ruling Camelot quite well. She's doing well at it, but she can't outrun her past and she can't outrun the corrupting effect that her magic has on it. Chris's supplement Memories of the Sea picks up the story after the Saxon invasion, a far less sudden event than old stories may make it seem. People talk about the Saxon invasion like it was a Saturday night rave. The Saxons came across Britain over the course of hundreds of years over and over and over again. And each time these groups of Saxons came over, they didn't just pillage and plunder. They settled and started farming lives and made generations and generations of Saxo-Britannic Celtic people that at the end of the day were just their own new thing. That's interesting to me as a storyteller because the concept of home 
is something that means something very different to a Saxon who's been on who spent their whole life on this little patch of land in Albion than it would to the raging barbarian that's coming off the boat, swinging his sword and beheading all of the peasants that are in his way. And so in creating this myth of Arthurian Saxons, the, the, the actual text doesn't give you much to work with. Arthurian Saxons and the Lamorta Arthur and the other co- historical components are the enemy other that Arthur's going to go fight. Sure. But the historical context of them as Britons, as these people who have settled this land and intermingled and brought their own faiths, but ultimately created new traditions and lives within a new context – is what I was what I really enjoy exploring when I tell stories of the Saxons in Albion. And so that's what Memories of the Sea is. It's a callback to the the shared cultural understanding that they brought with them across the ocean and how that shapes their experience when their new homeland, Albion, goes to pot. Chris has chosen a monster that reflects the seafaring origin of the Saxon people. The origin traces itself back to Roman times, back to Gallic legends around these regions of North France and Brittany. But she's an old myth that's been retold by the French, retold by the Germans and the Luxembourgs and into Czechoslovakia. In the original myth, the Melusine is the daughter of a human prince and a fae mother. As, as Melusine grows up, she resents her father and she's furious at her father for being this righteous king that has disowned his father weird half a family and so she goes off and murders him or walls him up in stone or otherwise removes him from the picture and her mom gets furious and curses her for it and so she's cursed to every seventh day transform into a serpent from the waist down so on saturdays she transforms into a serpent from the waist down she's still absolutely beautiful she's still beloved she's still this perfect being the rest of the time and so eventually She's noticed by a wandering prince who encounters her alongside a stream and they get married and they have a wonderful marriage in which he's just not allowed to see her on Saturdays. This shows up a lot in Old Miss. The thing that you must not do. That's right. You're told at the beginning of the story, don't do this one very specific thing. And of course, because you're human, eventually you do it. Yep. So they live for decades. She has, again, depending on the myth, most of the time it's 10 charming princes with this guy and brings prosperity to the land. Everyone loves her. And then, yeah, he eventually either bursts in to see the birth of one of his kids or he spies on her while she's bathing. He eventually catches her on a Saturday sometime, sees that she's half serpent, freaks out. She freaks out. Everyone runs away. And then she she flees the scene and still keeps watch at a distance of her children. Like she's still watching over her children today. And so that's the part that I ran with where, where she's this invisible force that is watching over her children. Unlike Medusa of Greek myth, which D&D transmuted into a species of monster. Chris has kept the Melusine's identity as a single non-player character. She is an all-powerful singular NPC in this setting. She is the Melusine. The original legend is intact and told as is. And then after her husband discovered her and she left and she's been spying on her children for ages and now her children's children's children. She's developed smarter and smarter ways to go about watching the surface world in general. Stats wise and settings wise, she's what's called a lay finder, which is a specific type of magic use or unique to the setting that draws on kind of magic directly. Lay finders lay finders experience the energy of magic through their senses in raw different ways so lay energy is this interconnected web that crisscrosses all of albion it's a big plot point it's the thing that morgana's corrupting it's also kind of the underlying network of the universe and lay finders experience that energy directly and so the contemporary melusine is essentially a spy master she's a an informant or she is a I, I like the term contagonist she's a very solid place to 
create a block that the players didn't know that they had. So whether she's withholding information that they need or whether she is preventing them from getting further toward a goal, she she's very much a a side character to make life more difficult. But she knows a lot of things. She's been a lot of places and she's watched a whole lot go down in the century since she was cast out by her former king. This gets back to the mythology. I love the repeated story of identity, acceptance, human happiness, and these very humanizing things applied to non-human beings. She's a fae, and the fae are enigmatic and weird and uncomfortable. Above all else, they're reflections of the counter-society parts of the culture. And players are the same thing. Characters are somewhere between murder hobos and extremely noble truth seekers, but whatever their particular alignment, they're always operating outside of societal norms. Everybody doesn't pick up a sword to go kill things. And so the Mm. Melusine at her core can be a reflection of operating outside societal norms as a piece of power. Besides that, she's chock full of all the old symbols of the feminine and all of the water, prosperity, fertility things that come from Celtic and Gaelic roots, where again, you're kind of countering that patriarchal force that was the prominent power in the time. And so you you have this you you have this gender oriented subversion that runs through medieval mythology. For people that play toward that direction, I'm not saying you have to interpret her that direction, but if you're playing a a a really high Arthurian romance interpretation of this campaign, she can lean into that concept of the feminine other as a empowering force. The other thing that I guess you can do with her is that because she is this concept of forbidden knowledge, she's also an anthropomorphization of land itself. You hear me talking about the lay network and about all of this natural magic energy. She can be that personified as a counterbalance to Morgana's usurping of power, Morgana has claimed this throne and she is, whether rightfully or not, she's she's there and she by being there, she's messing things up. You can spin the Melusine as kind of a nature force that is by her very existence corrective as kind of a counterbalance to that. That's amazing. I often have to work much harder to get this level of generalization out of my guests. So you're making it very easy. I appreciate that. I am very excited about this setting. (laughs) (laughs) I can tell. Much like the story of Faust I covered briefly in the first season, the Melusine has made so many ripples in our modern cultural heritage that you've probably already seen her and didn't even know it. Chris and I will tell you where right after the break, but I want to take a minute to tell you how you can become a contagonist of this show and get some pretty sweet stuff in the deal. Good stories start with good monsters, and the best monsters are at patreon.com slash scintilla studio. Tabletop gaming is about telling stories together, and since there's almost never time for the whole story of the monsters I feature on this show, I've created a space where we can tell those stories together. Get exclusive access to cut tape, meet my guests, and shape future episodes of the show. Plus, there's stickers! Find out more at patreon.com slash scintilla studio. That's patreon.com slash s-c-i-n-t-i-l-l-a dot studio. All right, back to the show. I I am going to take the chance to ask this, and it's unfortunate that I have to, I think. But I think the most similar touch point to this that the average listener might have is Disney's The Little Mermaid. Are there any similarities or differences that you want to point out to Ursula the Sea Witch? It's hard to not make them. I agree entirely. And I I, I would be (laughs) lying if I said the thought didn't cross my mind as I'm crafting her cave, right? (laughs) So, so and it's worth noting that actually um, Hans Christian Andersen was inspired by the Melusine myth. There is a direct line all the way back. Ursula's role was a Disney thing. But Ursula herself 
So, okay, you don't have 30 minutes here. Ursula herself <laughs> borrowed from the other side of the same coin as Ariel. Those are both merfolk, and they're both part of this same mythological grounding, which is fascinating to me because you you took Ursula, you took this beautiful, wonderful, uh, beautiful, wonderful, happy, fish-tailed, singy woman, and you made this tentacled, scary, thieving dwelling thing. And Ursula's tentacles are reflective of the Melusine's tale. Um, Melusine is also the Starbucks logo. And in most versions of the story, she, it's actually a split serpent tail. Her, her tail is like a snake, but picture a snake at the end and it just splits. That's the Melusine tail in a lot of the tales. And so the comparison <laughs> to Ursula isn't entirely unfair, the difference, I would say, is that is that my Melusine is not that evil. Melusine <laughs> is certainly self-motivated. She is certainly concerned with the going-ons of the world, but she is, and I suppose the gathering her garden of children isn't an entirely unfair comparison either. She is mostly concerned with keeping her children and her children's children and keeping all of these magical beings which are spread across the surface safe in whatever her definition of safe is. And so earlier I used the term contagonist mm -hmm. because she's not necessarily working against your characters. It's entirely possible, depending on how the story goes, that you could find this to be a very powerful ally in undoing some of this magical curse that's descended on Albion. But it's much more likely that you're going to run into some agent of the Melusine or you're going to cross paths with some particular part of her mission that struggles against yours. And so in that way, I would say that she's ideally not as villainous and um, <laughs> not not to rob Ursula of a particular brand of beauty. But I like to think that she's a little bit more striking. My guest Chris Hopper and the team at Realm Warp Media have graciously made available the holy grail of podcast extras, the full stat block for the Melusine, so you can see exactly how she works and how her story has been coded into the game. It's a great preview for the work Chris has done on Memories of the Sea, and you can get it by trusting me with your email address. Visit scintilla.studio slash monster or follow the link in the show notes. Where is the best place to find Cities of Myth and Memories of the Sea specifically? Uh, you can find Cities of Myth on Drive Through RPG and at realmwarpmedia.card.co. It is available on soft cover. It's a 60 odd page soft cover and a PDF. I am excited to finally get it out there. I finished this book in September. I can tell stories in Fallen Camelot for years just based on the 300 odd core page core book. The Cities of Myth series by Realm Warp Media will continue in Atlantis Divided, a new core rule book focused on the sunken city of Atlantis and intersecting with the work Chris has done with the Melusine in Memories of the Sea. Both Memories of the Sea and its companion volume Magic of the Celts are slated to be part of a Kickstarter for Atlantis Divided, which is set to launch in April. You'll find all those links in the show notes or at scintilla.studio slash monster. And don't forget to visit the all-new patreon.com slash scintilla studio. Music in this episode is from Will Savino. It's called The Fathomless. From his album Tasha's Musical Concoction, find out more at patreon.com slash musicd20. Thanks for listening to Making a Monster Season 2! This season, I'll be moving the show to a more bi-weekly episode schedule the first and third Mondays of each month with one or two of the more experimental episodes on the Mondays in between. So episode two will be out on February 1st with two new episodes following on the 15th and the 22nd. Next time on Making a Monster. This monstrosity itself is too large to fight in any traditional sense. Like you can't just pick up your spells and your swords and go down to the bottom of the sea and start stabbing this thing. You have to come up with more interesting means of, of dealing with it. The threat comes not from the monstrosity itself, but from what it does to the environment.
It's been releasing little twinkling spores into the sea that infest creatures with these uh, sort of starry mutations who then end up doing the bidding of this monstrosity, which wants to do one thing and one thing alone, and that is consume all magic. It wants to eat magic, get bigger and bigger until it has eaten everything.